Hello everyone, my name is Kelly Munn and I'm with the League of Education Voters. Welcome to our free online webinar series called Lunchtime Webinars. We started this series close to four years ago to share information and build knowledge on important and timely issues. We're just trying something a little bit different today. And um, we are streaming live a picture of what goes on behind the scenes on Facebook. So if you go to the League of Education Voters Facebook page, you can see us in action. Today, we are talking about the significant changes to the K-12 education funding structures that were made last year and the changes that infused more than $7 billion in state money into the system over four years through House Bill 2242. As the fiscal impacts of these changes become clear, legislators have proposed and finalized adjustments to the bill to address concerns that districts have voiced around the original bill. Today, we have Julia Worth, League of Education Voters Assistant Director of Policy and Government Relations, and Jake Thela, League of Education Voters Senior Policy Analyst. And they will explain which school funding proposal passed during the 2018 legislative session and will answer your questions. Let me give you a little background about Julia and Jake. Julia is the Assistant Director of Policy and Government Relations, and she joined the League of Education Voters in 2015. Prior to joining LAV, she worked as a senior research analyst for the Washington State Board of Ed. Um, she helped to launch uh, the Washington State Charter School Association, and she worked some in public policy consulting. And I've been with LAV for so long that I remember when Julia was an intern. <laughs> <laughs> Julia is committed to helping create a school system in which every student has access to an education that prepares and empowers students. Julia received her bachelor's in literature and government from Claremont McKenna College in Southern California and returned home to Seattle for her master's in education from the University of Washington. When she's not in the office, Julia enjoys playing in the mountains, spending time with her family, and her dog, Gus. And Jake Vela is a senior policy analyst with the League of Education Voters. Jake, um, Jake Vela has a strong desire to get involved in the civic process, led him to work in the election cycle in Nevada. That adventure compelled him to work as a legislative assistant in the Nevada legislature, where he focused on civic engagement and electoral issues. The strong civic culture and beautiful scenery of the great Northwest managed to lure him away from Nevada. After settling in Seattle, Jake attended the Evans School of Public Affairs at the University of Washington. Prior to joining the League of Education Voters, Jake worked with local nonprofits in strategic planning and working to develop policies to improve the quality of life of formerly homeless individuals in downtown Seattle. Jake received his BA in political science in Spanish from the University of Nevada. He earned his Master's of Public Administration from the Evans School of Public Affairs with a focus on policy analysis and urban policy. When not in the office, he can be found wandering the Cascades, enjoying Seattle's parks, honing his skills as a home brewer. Also, he likes to go out and scavenge for mushrooms. He's the guy to talk to. Or watching terrible 90s action movies. And like most of the policy team at Lab, he has a dog also, a new one called Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of housekeeping items before we begin. You'll notice a, a Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. This is a place for you to pose questions to us. As always, feel free to send any feedback about the quality to us on that function, that Q&A function, or to info at educationvoters.org. And with that, I'd like to welcome Jake and Julia. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, I feel like we should give you a bio or something <laughs> at this point. Um, uh, so what we're gonna do today, uh, and you should have this available on your screens, is we are going to go through um, our side-by-side -side document, and thank you to Jake for pulling this together very quickly at the end of session. Um, but we are going to walk through what um, the law was as passed in 2017 compared to what was passed this session in 2018. So we'll highlight the changes. It won't necessarily be a comprehensive review of the legislation. Um, and then we will open it up to questions. 
Um, so first of all, when Lev is thinking about funding systems, we've got kind of four main principles here. So we want a funding system that directs investments based on student need. Um, we want a funding system that eliminates disparities between districts. Um, and we want a funding system that attracts and retains effective educators and a funding system that has increased transparency so we can track the effectiveness of investments. Um, so changes made uh, to uh, what was passed in 2017 through um, Senate Bill 6362 um, deal with a couple of issues, a couple of main issues. So we've got teacher salaries, regionalization, um, timing of investments, um, some modifications made to um, categorical and student support investments, um, and uh, let's the, yeah, timing of implementation. So we'll go through some of those changes. So um, the first and probably biggest uh, shift is uh, around teacher salaries. So in 2242, which was passed in 2017, um, the legislature was going to phase in the increase in teacher salaries so that 50% of the increase would be provided to districts in the 2018-19 school year and then the remaining 50% would be provided in the 2019-2020 school year. The Supreme Court uh, told the state legislature that that was not in compliance with their ruling and that the state would still be held in contempt um, if they faced in teacher salary. Um, and then with a very optimistic revenue forecast this year, the legislature decided that they could do full implementation of the increase in teacher salary um, in the coming school year. So. Uh, uh, the legislature invested um, an additional $776 million into teacher salary in the 2018-19 school year, and that will be full implementation of the staff salary increases. Um, the legislature also created a new uh, mechanism uh, for um, modifying teacher salary by district. Um, so whereas in House Bill 2242 in 2017, the legislature had eliminated staff mix, so every district would receive the same average salary for every teacher um, to then allocate as they saw fit for teacher salaries. Um, the legislature in this year created a new factor called the experience factor. This would be a flat 4% increase for districts that have above the state average in uh, teacher experience and master's degrees. Um, and this experience factor would be provided to districts starting in 2019-2020 and would go through the 2022-23 school year. Um, it would be based on the current characteristics of the teachers in that district. Um, and currently it looks like about 55 or 56 school districts would be eligible for this experience factor in 2019. Um, it is not necessarily uh, all districts that had previously high staff mix. Um, so that is that on teacher salary. Um, the Legislature also made some modifications to the regionalization factor that was put into place in 2017. So previously districts um, who had uh, high costs of um, housing in their districts would be eligible for a regionalization factor. And there were four tiers. Um, so the first tier is zero, no regionalization factor. Um, the second tier is 6%, uh, then 12% and 18%. Um, so the legislature this year to address concerns about districts that neighbored other districts with higher regionalization factors um, put into place uh, a new uh, requirement that any district that is west of the Cascades, um, so this only applies to Western Washington, um, if that if there is a district that neighbors a district that has more than six percent higher regionalization then that uh that original district gets an additional six percent in regionalization all right um so then there's a couple of timing changes that are made uh, because of the bump up in the implementation of full funding of teacher salaries. Um, so previously um, requirements around how, um, how districts are accounting 
for their local levy funds and keeping them in a designated local <laughs> levy account and then reporting on those use on the use of those funds um, that was originally supposed to start in the 2019-2020 school year. That implementation has been bumped up to 2018-2019, um, as well as the restrictions on what districts can use local levy funds for. Um, previously, that also corresponded with full implementation of teacher salary, and so that has also been bumped up to the 2018-19 school year. Um, moving on to, oh, sorry, one last thing on the timing of uh, 2242. So previously, the state was going to fund um, three professional development days uh, for teachers, and uh, the phase in for that was supposed to begin in the 2018-19 school year, so one day next year, two days in 2019-2020, and then three days um, in 2020-21 and every year after. Um, that implementation has been delayed so that the first year of state-funded professional development will now be in 2019-2020, um, and then two days the following year, three days the, the year after that, and in perpetuity. Um, moving on to some of the categorical um, slash student support uh, funding changes. Um, in 2242, there was a new funding factor created called the, um, the high poverty concentration factor. This would have provided additional funding um, to the learning assistance program for schools, and it specified that it would have to go to school buildings, um, that had uh, above 50% enrollment of students that qualify for free and reduced price lunch. Um, there were concerns about schools that would flip back and forth over that threshold and the stability of that funding. Um, so the legislature addressed that this year by making schools eligible if they have a 50% free and reduced life, free and reduced price in enrollment um, uh, over a three-year rolling average. Um, so it creates some more stability. So if you're a, a school that has you know, 51% one year, 49% the next, and then 50 the next, you would still qualify. Um, so that was a, a beneficial change. Um, the legislature also increased the multiplier for um, special education students. Um, previously, uh, districts would receive about 93% um, of the basic education allocation in additional funding per special education student. Um, that multiplier was increased to be 96.09% um, of the basic education allocation um, in additional funding. And I believe that comes out to an additional 27 million or so in um, special education funding um, over the next year. Um, let's see. There were also some modifications made to the highly capable program um, when the legislature in 2242 increased highly capable funding. Um, they also specified that districts should identify students in an equitable manner, um, but they didn't really define what that looked like or how students should be identified. Um, so in 63-62, this session, um, they put a little more meat on the bones and uh, specified uh, that districts should use multiple measures um, to identify highly capable students, um, outline some examples of what that would look like, um, some nonverbal assessments and things for students that are um, non-English speaking, um, and, uh, and what types of things would disqualify or qualify a student for highly capable. Um, so they added some additional clarity there. Um, Let's see, and then finally, um, in 2242, it was unclear if um, public charter schools and uh, tribal compact schools would be eligible for the regionalization and other salary enhancements that districts, district schools receive. Um, 6362 clarifies that, um, that public charter schools and tribal compact schools indeed will be eligible for the regionalization factor um, dependent upon the district in which they are located. So if you are located in a district that receives 6% regionalization, then that public charter school would also receive 6% regionalization. Um, so uh, with that, there are a couple other um, you know, 
I don't want to say smaller, but um, other policy changes. Um, there will be a work group established to define a school day, and that will include what um, the instructional day is, as well as what are the um, basic education duties that might happen outside of the typical instructional day. Um, that then facilitate the provision of basic education. Um, so what are the duties outside of the school day that teachers may be engaging in that type of thing? Um, and OSPI will be convening that. There were some adjustments to the um, factor that will be used for inflation and adjusting cost of living. Um, and uh, there were some changes as well to um, restrictions around supplemental contracts for teachers. Um, and restricting time-based supplemental contracts um, to the same hourly rate as that teacher would have received for their basic education contract, um, but there is not that same restriction for non-time-based um, supplemental contracts. Uh, so with that, uh, we will open it up to any questions. Thank you, Julia. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Folks who are listening, um, remember that no question is too basic. In fact, the question that you ask is probably a question that most people on this line want to know, want to have answered. Um, the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen is the way to type the question in. Um, while we're waiting for some questions, well, actually, yeah, there's no way there's several <laughs> in already. Forget that. Normally, I don't get to ask questions first. Okay, can we get a copy of this side-by-side -side document? Yes, it is available on the League of Education Voters website. Why does the legislature think it's constitutional to have a widening opportunity and achievement gap? This is what is being said by the Supreme Court by omission. Great question. That is a great question, and if we had another three hours, we could probably hold an online debate. Um, I, I, well, so we at LEV also take issue with the widening achievement and opportunity gap, and that is why um, our work on uh, funding um, and one of the issues we have with the changes made this year is that they do not actually address student needs, that the, the funding system that is being put in place does not go far enough um, to provide the services that would help close those opportunity and achievement gaps. So that is part of our continuing work, um, both in the interim and gearing up for the 2019 session. So whoever asked this question, if you would like to participate in that work with us, um, we are always looking for partners and advocates um, to help um, change the legislature's mind and let them know that they need to continue to address this, that McCleary, even if they're in full compliance with McCleary, according to the Supreme Court, we don't believe that the work is done. Thank you. Why do our legislators tout an increase to special ed funding when there is really a net loss in funds to many districts? Um, so that is a really good question. Um, I think that legislators this year in their increase to the multi to the special education multiplier were trying to address um, some of these concerns brought by districts. And for a little bit of context, there were many districts who felt that um, that special education with the new restrictions on local levy funds, many districts we're using local levy funds to backfill special education because the state funding was not sufficient. With the new restrictions on local levy funds not being used for basic education, um, districts were going to experience a loss in special education funding. Um, I think the legislature attempted to address that with this multiplier, um, but it remains to be seen if that is uh, sufficient. Thank you. How are you interpreting what limits are put in place on collective bargaining this year? One lawmaker who helped craft the budget said that the existing underlying law makes it so contracts can't be opened up this year, which seems to me to be an oversimplification. Jake, did you? <clears throat> yes, uh, so um, there are some um, stipulations put into this law specifically impacts um, how much 
districts could allocate for teacher salary in the upcoming 18-19 school year and are only in, a, in effect for that year. And what it effectively says is that any agreement that was opened essentially after the passage of 2242 um, to before this next school year must adhere to these restrictions, which essentially limits um, the increase in funding to either the statewide current average for this upcoming school year, which will be a little over $70,000, or um, inflationary increases over the current level. Um, but th the important thing in there is that <clears throat> the, the current average salary that districts pay, there is a state portion and a local portion for most districts. So the money that is actually being spent on teacher salary, a lot of it actually does come from local levy sources. Um, so the number that they're using as the baseline is including that locally funded salary. So you're not going to see a net decrease in the salary that's going to the average teacher. You're just going to see limitations placed on that. Um, I'm not quite sure on the underlying, underlying reasons behind that. That does, does not also preclude um, districts from opening up CBAs. They're allowed to do that. They just can't. If they do, they just must adhere to these regulations within, within the new uh, statute. Thank you, Jake. Is there still a gap between what the state is paying for special ed and what districts uh, uh, say currently? How big is this gap, and which, and when will that happen? Um, so, without having any of the numbers in front of me, um, I think that there are likely still districts for which there will be a special education funding gap. Um, I think that this is certainly going to be a conversation that is going to continue in the legislature next year. Um, and so I am not sure when or what will happen. Um, uh, and we kind of have to wait and see what the, the increase to the multiplier does in terms of what that gap looks like for districts. The legislature also passed a bill this year to reduce property taxes. Does this have any effect on K through 12 funding, or did they backfill that funding from other sources? Yes, um, <clears throat> there, there was a companion bill um, that was passed out um, that did lower property taxes from the current, um, the previous level of around two dollars and seventy cents for thousand dollars of assessed value to two dollars and forty cents. So that thirty cent decrease in state the state portion of property tax. Um, was done because of the higher than expected revenue forecast that the legislature received. Um, so with that, they decided to do two things. One, to reduce the state property tax, but also the rest of that increased um, revenue forecast was what um, actually was able to fully fund um, teacher salary per state law for this upcoming school year rather than the 2019-2020 school year. Thank you. On the extra $458 million that was put in to fully funding salaries, is this a one-time hit, or will this be part of the ongoing education funding from the state? Um, the additional money that will be spent in this upcoming school year because the state's fully funding teacher salary one year early um, will be in a, a, essentially a one-time hit to um, the, the budget or how much is spent on education. It's not going to um, be a, a, a several hundred million dollar increase year over year. Um, rather than making that payment in the 2019-2020 school year, they're making that one year earlier. So you're going to have to make one more payment, but it won't have any fiscal impact um, additionally beyond this next school year. It'll essentially become part of maintenance level, is that right? Correct. Great. Thank you. Can you define regionalization factors? <laughs> Good question. Um, so the regionalization factor is a funding formula factor um, that takes into account, um, it, it was designed to take into account um, the cost of living in school districts. So recognizing that there are some districts in the state where it is more expensive to live and so you would need to be able to pay your teachers more in order to live in that district. Um, what they and there are states across the country have regionalization factors and they structure them in various different ways and calculate cost of living in different ways. Um, how Washington's legislature chose to structure it was to look at the cost of single family housing, is that right? 
um, in the district and um, and adjust salary um, allocations based on that. Um, so it's based on a fairly um, narrow concept of what the cost of living is within a district and just takes into consideration those housing costs. And to add on to that, um, we actually don't know the specifics of the formula. Um, <laughs> they've outlined it in state law, but there's a lot of ambiguity in that. Um, so the actual actual underlying data or numbers to kind of um, set the different levels and who, um, what districts are at what tier, we don't actually know those underlying um, formula numbers. Yeah. So when you look at the current um, schedule of who gets what regionalization factor, there's actually more tiers. At full implementation, you'll have 0, 6%, 12%, and 18%. But right now, there are some districts that are even higher than that or at these kind of weird in-between uh, tiers. And that's where the ambiguity and how exactly all of that was calculated comes into play. <laughs> Additionally, there were some districts um, across the state, especially in eastern Washington, that had um, a relatively high staffing factor, but not necessarily high um, housing value, um, that did receive some level of reasonization factor. So there were um, some other <clears throat> considerations that were used to um, set the different districts at the different levels. Thank you. Do you know how many districts got a 6% increase because their neighboring district had it, and what is the reasoning behind west of the crest of the Cascade Mountain? <laughs> Everybody's favorite term, right? Um, so we think about six districts um, that yeah, current, about six yeah, um, will receive uh, this bump uh, because of their neighboring district regionalization. Um, I actually don't know the reason for the rest of the crest west of the crest of the Cascade Mountains, um, if that was a political consideration or if that's just where those districts actually were located that would be impacted by it. So Jake, I don't know if you have other insights into why that language. No, yeah. I, I okay. do not. <laughs> <All right. laughs> that is a question for the legislators, I think. Why is the state not using revenue from pot tax? But that's kind of out of our normal realm, but I thought I'd ask the question in case someone knew it. My understanding is that <clears throat> the revenues from um, Initiative 502 that passed several years back was are specifically allocated to certain certain um, buckets that must be spent in a certain way based on the law that was passed and subsequent changes in state statute. Um, I'm not familiar with the <clears throat> all the revenues that that has brought in and where those are going. Thank you. The experience of regionalization increases on page one of the side by side. What is the real difference of these new factors from the prior staff mix? In terms of structure or amount, do we still have the Questioner. No. So, um, okay. So um, the the impact of the regionalization and the experience factor, um, as related to staff mix factor, changes the distribution of both. Okay. <laughs> Um, changes the distribution of which districts get more from the state. So if you look at a map of staff mix factor, um, and I'll put a plug in, we are developing maps and doing presentations, so um, stay tuned for some of those. Um, it's kind of randomly scattered across the state. Um, regionalization factor then concentrates which districts are getting additional funding from the state very much in the Puget Sound area with some districts on the eastern side of the state dating regionalization. Um, so it changes the distribution across the state of who is getting uh, extra state money. Um, and then uh, similarly experience factor also changes that distribution. Um, 
In terms of amounts, um, the whole state bumped up in average salary. So the average teacher salary will be 64,000, whereas before it was around 50, 54,000. 54, mm -hmm. um, so the elimination of staff mix and then the move to a higher average salary um, theoretically increased the salary for teachers across the state. And then regionalization will further increase the salaries in um, certain districts, as we said, they're concentrated in the Puget Sound area. And additional. the districts that will be um, getting experience factor based on their um, the current staff um, mix of experience and education um, are pretty evenly distributed across the state. There is a, um, districts from eastern Washington to the Puget Sound region that will be eligible for that factor. Um, and although they're using current data, um, to see who falls into um, that those categories. Um, the districts who are currently eligible for it will be getting that factor um, according to the, the documents produced by the legislature starting in the 2019-2020 school year through the 2022-23 school year regardless of how um, their workforce may change in the coming years. Um, and <clears throat> every teacher in that district will generate the extra 4% increase in salary which is equivalent to roughly $2,500 per teacher. Um, and so whether it's a first year teacher or a 25th year teacher, every teacher that does school generates that additional funding for that district. We have just uh, received information that uh, some, uh, one of our listeners who uh, may know the answer has said that the marijuana revenue is being used for education. We suspect, uh, and we know part of that, that the uh, education is around drug use, is my understanding. Um, so clearly, we're going to look back and find out a little bit more about what the pot, what pot is used for it in the state of Washington, pot money. <laughs> we know what it's used for. <laughs> <laughs> so this is going to probably be our last question, or one of two questions to wrap us up. The question is, will you be posting the questions and answers on your website? Uh, yeah, so we post recordings of all of our webinars on the League of Education Voters website. Um, I believe they are under the resources tab. Is that correct? Get involved. Uh, okay, they are under get involved. Um, so that is where you can find uh, a recording of this webinar and our lively Q&A session. Um, and our website, if you need a reminder, is www.educationvoters, with an S, dot org. Thank you so much, Julia and Jake. Um, thanks to everyone listening today for joining us. If you have any additional questions or comments, please send them to Kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, at educationvoters.org. Uh, as said earlier, a recording will be posted um, almost immediately, typically, but no later than 24 hours later. And please feel free to share that recording with your friends and colleagues. Um, uh, we have not determined our next uh, webinar, but we will be notifying you soon of what, we're, what uh, our next speaker will be and our subject will be. And thank you again for attending. We hope to, see, to hear from you again.